Welcome to the Church at Rock Creek Online. I'm Jason Curry. This is Mark Evans. We're continuing in our series, But God. Sometimes God does things that we don't expect right when we need it. I know. And it, and it changes everything. It does. It does. Especially when when our behavior doesn't uh, doesn't uh, warrant it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't look like we, we even want God to show up. That's right. So we're so glad that you're here. Well, if you got a question, something going on in your life today, there's a number right there on the screen. Maybe God's working in your life. Maybe you need a but God moment. Text us. We'd love to interact with you. Maybe it's time for you to get back on campus, get plugged in. There's all kinds of things going on at Rock Creek. Also, church at rockcreek.com. If you're a member regular attender. That's how you give your offerings so that we can continue to take Jesus as he is to people as they are. We're outside. I spent my whole childhood getting told to go outside. I know. it. That's not surprising, is it? And we get to go outside now. (laughs) That's right. Hey, let me pray for you. We're going to have a great time today. Father, we love you so much. Uh, Thank you that you continue to intervene and act even when we're rebellious, even when we run, when we're not sure what's going to happen next. You are faithful. We love you. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week I'm at Whole Foods and I, I go there to Whole Foods a lot of times. I love their their fruit. I know it's a little bit expensive, but it's really <laughs> good. All right. and it's all right. And so I want to get the blueberries, okay? Okay. There's a guy, a man in front of me there. And I notice he's taking the, the containers. You know, the containers are already made and they, they, okay. they say they're uh, $3.99 a piece. Okay. And he's taking stacks of these containers out and going over to the little weigh scale there and he's weighing each one and then he's stacking them based on their weight you're intrigued now i am intrigued and i am thinking are you on medication (laughs) he does that and i'm not this is not exaggeration he does that oh he weighs 30 35 different containers wow all of them he is going back and forth right in front of me i mean i'm standing here he is right here doing this and then he looks at me finally and i looked at him and i said so you work here i knew he didn't work there okay i said you work here he said no i said so you're weighing all of them he said yeah you couldn't help yourself (laughs) what what are you doing he said well i'm weighing all of them and then he just turned around and walked away. Couldn't understand how you couldn't get that. Not at all. I did not buy any blueberries because he had touched all of them. You know, it's COVID and stuff. I don't I don't want to be around that. But here we come in Jonah. What does that got to do with this? Okay. Jonah, we look at him in Jonah chapter four. What are you doing, Jonah? It is interesting how the progression has happened for Jonah. He has gone from rebelling in in the first chapter of Jonah to running from God, then the next chapter, he gets everything right with God, and he mm-hmm. says, all right, God, I'm back with you. Then, then he, he, he's got to get, kind of get restarted in chapter 3, and he starts wanting to walk with God. But now in chapter 4, what we're going to see today mm-hmm. is Jonah, he, he regrets what he's done. He believes that there is absolutely no way what should happen, that what's about to happen should happen. Hmm. He thinks that I, there's no way that God ought to love these people. And for Jonah, it only gets worse from here. But he, what he does is, is he continues to make his case to prove to God that, that God, you're wrong about these people. You're wrong about these Ninevites. They aren't worth your love. You know, God wants you to know he wants you to know that you are worth his love. God wants you to know that the, the person who is far different from you is worth his love. So, so what God does, he sends his son Jesus, and you, you know this, Jesus paid it all. He paid for all of our sin. Well, Jonah keeps fighting, though, within himself that there is no way that God loves everyone, mm-hmm. and he, he grows to become such an angry person. Uh, Jonah is a miserable man. He is he is stuck in a bad cycle of always trying to prove that he is right, and his anger just grows. You know, you know, Jason. When you have to prove that you're right, you're yes. you're probably not right. No. And and when things don't go your way, you have a choice to make, and your choice 
Well, your choice can reveal your maturity or your misery. Uh, you know, what's the difference? Let's talk about this for a minute, Jason. Yeah. What's the difference between between maturity and misery for a person? Gosh, from, I, I think probably from a spiritual standpoint, you know, uh, Jonah is just seeing things here, now, yeah. temporary, this moment. I want to be right. I want to get even. A lot of those sentences begin with I, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And how really I does. feel and how I want to get back. Maturity, I think, Mark, always begins or, or at some point leads us to care about others, yeah. to help others, to, to be there for others. It, it's not a coincidence that as we grow in our faith, God leads us to a place where we're loving others in light of eternity, mm -hmm. not just the temporary. Yeah. Misery is always about me and mine and right, right now. now. Yes. Yeah, all yeah that. that's great. That's great. And that, that's key. You know, that Jonah, what he has done, he has made several mistakes that have, have led him to being miserable. Yes. Okay. You know, remember from last week, he thought he could run from God. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's prejudiced against people whom actually, he's prejudiced against people whom God loves. All right. Uh, politics for him were way more important than than salvation of people mm. and and Jonah was only interested in his nation not everybody else not the whole world so when he goes to Nineveh he's running from God a little later in Jonah he reluctantly does what God wants him to but he does that even with a bad attitude when he eventually goes to Nineveh and instead of Instead of, I just want to catch you up here for a second. Instead of giving a message of love and forgiveness and that, that God wants you to change if you'll just turn back to him, and that's the message that God wants him to, to give, he walks in to these guys in Nineveh and he says, okay, y'all are going to die. Bye. <laughs> and and, and now, now Jonah has resentment on full display. And when things don't go Jonah's way, that resentment begins to grow. You got to always remember this about resentment. Resentment never helps. It always hurts. Resentment for Jonah, though, it goes to a whole new level. How? Because it is directed toward God. You know, God, why did you let this happen? Why didn't, why didn't you do anything uh, about this? And there are a couple of mistakes, Jason, that Jonah makes that really do make him totally miserable. Yeah. And, and we're going to learn from this right now. Okay, the first one is this, write this down, okay? Resenting God's plan because it doesn't fit my plan. You will be miserable when you resent God's plan because it just doesn't fit your plan. Um, resentment, and, and I don't know who first said it, Jason, resentment is like like drinking poison, yeah, hoping it kills the other person. <laughs> it just infects you. Yeah. yeah, it's always gonna hurt you more than it hurts them. Um, you know, what have you seen? What have you seen resentment do to people? Oh, man. Uh, resentment, it, it, and it just kind of, uh, uh, my, my thought here, it steals everything. Yeah. Uh, steals joy, steals kindness, steals um, freedom, purpose, mission. Almost like everything that God's called us to be as mm -hmm. Christians, yeah. resentment just, just gets right in the way of that. And it makes sense, uh, Mark. Uh, Jesus said we're supposed to love God with all of our heart and then love others. Resentment will not allow that to happen, yeah. and that's what you see happening to Jonah. You know, and it's a key way that the devil steps in and into our lives today. That he, that he uh, he tries to 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 rob us of anything that that is a fruit from our life that the yeah. Holy Spirit would would do in our life. Um, so why was Jonah resentful? Well, because he wanted his enemies, the city of Nineveh, to be destroyed. God's response was, well, I want to forgive them. I want to, to warn them and hope that they'll turn back to me. But Jonah doesn't want God to forgive them. He doesn't want, he didn't want God to let them off the hook. In Jonah chapter 3, read along there. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their evil way, then God relented of the disaster which he had declared he would bring on them. So he did not do it but greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Then he complained to the Lord. Another version of the Bible says that he, he prayed and complained to the Lord. Now, now, this change of plans here really upsets Jonah. He actually becomes furious. Jonah, when he, when he prays to the Lord, when he complains to the Lord about it, uh, God, God says, well, I just want you to go to Nineveh and warn them that if they don't straighten up, 
things are, are going to change. Now, that's a signal right there when God says that. That's a signal. It's a signal that, that God wants to forgive them. By the way, don't ever miss that signal in your life, okay? Mm -hmm. When God signals to you, hey, pay attention, because I want to forgive you. Well, that's what God wanted to do, but Jonah didn't want that to happen. So when, when God warns, Jonah is hoping that he has, that, that God has destruction on his mind. But Jonah gets angry when God doesn't destroy him. And his, his, resentment, uh, his resentment toward God just begins to grow. Uh, it kind of goes into overdrive. How do you know? You know, how do you know when you're resentful to God? Well, I, in scripture here, you're, you're going to find five emotions in your life. And, and these are signs that you are resenting God right now. Like, like the frustration. This, this change of plans upset Jonah. He, the Bible says he became furious, so there's anger. He complained to the Lord, the Bible says. Well, there's a lot of self-pity self there. In, in verse 3 of Jonah 4, uh, Jonah says, Now I ask you, Lord, please kill me, for it is better for me to die than live. Well, depression, you see, it's, it's better for me to die than live. And, and then he, he gets to the point, to the extreme point of being yeah. suicidal. Lord, please kill me. Mm. Now, I cannot emphasize enough, this is extreme resent, resentment. Jonah is not at all rational. Because you've got to think for a minute. Think of all the things that God has done for Jonah so far in his life. All the things that he has survived because of miracles. He survives a storm at sea that we yeah. saw last week. He survives being thrown overboard by these sailors. He survives being swallowed by a giant fish. All of these things have happened, but he's still alive. And still, in the fourth chapter of this book, he says, I just want to die. How in the world did you get here? What are you doing, Jonah? This is what happens, though. This is what happens when hate, hate feel, fills your heart. Because hate filling your heart will cause all kinds of emotions. Resentment filling your heart will, will cause these kinds of emotions. It starts with frustration. Things aren't going the way you want them to go. Then the frustration goes to anger. I'm angry with God because things are, he's not doing the things I think he ought to do. Then, then there's self-pity and from their depression. And then it, it could move on. Well, I may, may as well die. It, it just keeps progressing. You see, that's what happens when you hold hate in your heart and there's got to be some reason why do we do that why do why do we hold hate in our heart why, why do we hold on to, to that hate in our heart and and the resentment when we're when we're not in that emotional state mark it don't make sense no right yeah and uh, every every human struggles with this it, but outside of it we know I mean this is just hurting me mm -hmm. this is keeping me from who it is that God's calling me to uh, there's uh, control there. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when other people hurt me, I feel like hurting them is going to get uh, me even, and it starts to build and build and build. I really think back, uh, uh, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, when we're holding on to that ring that we think's giving us life, yeah. but it's actually killing us from the inside out. Yeah. And so, I would say the word that I would use here is it's deception. Mm -hmm. We think it's going to deliver something that it never will. Yeah, you know, and and there's a point in those emotions of hate and resentment toward someone. That, that you like the feeling it gives you. Oh. Because you like the feeling of I'm controlling them by, by, yeah. by ha being resentful toward them. And the longer you live there, yeah. the more that house feels like home. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and it, you, you're not, you're not going let, to let it go. Yeah. Because it's just, this is... This Who is, I am. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Man, you think about this for a second. Who are you holding hate against right now? Mm. Because hatred in your heart starts you down a road that doesn't have a healthy destination at all. And it's exactly what's happening to Jonah. The second mistake he makes that makes really makes him miser miserable. Is, and I want you to write this down. Resenting God's mercy. Resenting God's mercy because I don't think they deserve it. Resenting God's mercy because I don't think they deserve it. You know, Jonah. Jonah hates that God is forgiving people he doesn't like. They're not only his political enemy, but also his, he is also uh, racially prejudiced. And so this just feeds Jonah. In chapter two, I mean, excuse, in chapter four, verse two, in verse two, 
the Bible says, then he complained to the Lord and he said, please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish. He's still making his claim. This is, this is why I was right yeah, to run. I was right and you were wrong. Yeah, you're wrong, God. Since I knew that you're a compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster. Jonah is saying, God, I knew you were going to do this again. That's why I went to Tarshish in the first place. Should have left me there. Uh-huh. Jonah says, I, I knew this is how you'd respond. I knew you're slow to anger. I knew you'd, f- you'd rather forgive than punish. And that really makes Jonah mad. Why? Because Jonah had a problem that you and I have too. We want forgiveness for ourselves, but we want justice for everybody else. Mm. God, we want, we, it's like we say, God, you show me mercy. But the guy who hurt me, or that person who who thinks that they believe what they believe is right, God, you go get them, okay? Huh. You know, who who do you want God not to forgive? Now think about that for a second. Who is it that you want God not to forgive? Jason, I call it the Jonah trap. And yeah. the Jonah trap is is forgive me, but forget about them. Yeah. There's we, a yeah, it's con- there's a self righteousness here. Yeah, because okay, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as yeah. And then we fill it in, and it's kind of a self justification of whatever I've done. And when we're doing that, I think Mark, we're kind of setting ourselves up to be the judge of who's who gets God's mercy yeah. and forgiveness and who doesn't. Who doesn't? Yeah. And when he doesn't do what we think he ought to do, yeah, we get resentful. You know, jo- Jonah, he he he, the, he has uh, this this motive, this possible motive, and we see it in the in the Living Bible uh, translation of this verse in of Jonah 4, 3. I'm gonna put it uh, right there so you can see on the screen. Jonah says, I'd rather be dead than alive when nothing that I told them has happened. <laughs> <laughs> what he, he's worried about, he's worried about his reputation. Yes. He said, God, you told me to go to Nineveh and tell them in 40 days the city's gonna be destroyed if you don't, if you don't, uh, uh, turn if you don't repent, you don't come back, and it hadn't happened, and that, that God, that makes me look bad. He, Jonah is more worried about about how he looks than about people's salvation. He'd rather see an entire city destroyed than make him look bad. Now, think about this for a second. It, resenting God's plan when it doesn't fit your plan, you know, resenting God's mercy. When they give it, when God gives them mercy and they don't deserve it, how do I change if if I find myself in this Jonah trap? Forgive me, but forget about them, God. Well, I want to I want to give you uh, real quickly here some some real keys, some keys to move you out of your misery, move you from ministry. Here here's four things I want you to write down. But God can see number one. But God can see things I can't. If I'm going to move out of my misery, I've got to know God can see things I can't. Verse 4, but the Lord, there it is, but the Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? But the Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? You know, when you doubt God's wisdom, you have forgotten that God is God and you're not. Verse 5, Then Jonah left the city, sat down east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. You see what's going on here? Jonah is still hoping that even though God God says he's going to forgive the city, Jonah's hoping God's going to destroy him. So he goes up on a hill outside the city and he sits down and he's just waiting to watch the show. He's wanting God to destroy the largest city in the world at that time. It's going to be quite a show, he's thinking, it's, but it is an incredibly hot day, okay? And this is interesting. Second, second key to moving you out of misery, God is still good when I'm mad. But God is still good when I'm mad. Now, now remember, Jonah is sitting in the hot sun at the time. Verse 6, so the Lord designated, circle that if you've got your Bible, a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be shade over his head to relieve him of his discomfort. And Jonah was overjoyed about the plant. Now, Jonah is just being a jerk, okay? And, and, and God still cared for his, his discomfort in the heat. 
Notice what it's the, the Bible says there, that God designated or God arranged. That is key because it's the same word where, in the Bible where God says that he designated a great fish. He custom made this fish. Here he custom makes a broadleaf plant to spring up quickly and provide shade over Jonah while he's sitting there. You see, he's worried about Jonah's discomfort. E even though Jonah's attitude is absolutely terrible, you, you know, God cares about you, even when you're a jerk. He, he, you, you don't know how many times God has made your life comfortable when you didn't deserve it. You, 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 know, you may have been going the exact opposite of, of what God, where God wants you to be, but God's still covering you with shade. He's still watching over you. God's still caring about your discomfort because that's the kind of God he is. He loves you even when, when you're not worth loving. Here's the third thing. But God is in control of the details. I'm going to, I got to understand moving me from my ministry, God's still in my misery. God is still in control of, of the details. The Bible says, but God, there it is, but God designated a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the planet and it withered. And when the sun came up, God designated a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and he begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. See, God is designating all sorts of things in Jonah's life. You know, he's custom making a fish, a plant, a worm, a scorching wind. And by the way, I want you to know something. Remember this back in last week. God arranged the dice to reveal to those sailors that Jonah was the problem. Hmm. You, you remember that part of the story. God arranged a great fish to transport Jonah back to where he was supposed to be. God arranged a fast-growing plant to provide shade over Jonah. And God arranged a, a worm to eat that plant. It's all been arranged, custom-made, ordained. And I want you to listen to me. The things that you think are disappointments in your life, your disappointments really are God's appointments. Because the more you fight the plan God has for you, the more miserable you're going to be. Once you get this, in your life, sometimes God arranges some really big things just to, to swallow you up like a big fish, okay? When you're headed in the wrong direction and God spits you in the right direction. Other times God arranges uh, something brand new that comes up suddenly in your life like that plant. Okay, He arranges something like that plant that springs up suddenly and, and provides uh, you with some kind of comfort. And sometimes God provides something totally new in your life, even, even when you're not where you ought to be. But God, he, he gives you comfort even in those situations. See, God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to move. He wants you to get going. He doesn't want you to, to keep sitting uh, on the on the hill under the shade plant for the rest of your life. Now, God wants you to, to understand he arranges the things in your life. He arranges the things in your life to, to help to get you in the place that he wants you to be. Like a, a, that real s small worm to eat away at, at your comfortable uh, place, your comfortable position. And and when you, when you get that, when you understand that, man, then God can begin to do some things in your life that only God can do. So, God creates this short-lived, he creates this short-lived short plant to provide shade, allows it to die. And in verse nine, but God, there it is again, said to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I've got good reason to be angry even to the point of death. So Jonah, he completely misses the whole point. He, the whole point is this, but God, number four, reminds me to focus on what will last. When I'm miserable, I've got to change my focus. It's from me to what will last forever. It's from, it's like what Jason said earlier, it's from me always getting me in trouble. I got to focus on really what's the most important, what's going to last forever. In verse 10 of Jonah 4, then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not 
I should not also have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. You know, Bible scholars debate what it's meant by these 120,000 people who don't know their left hand from their right hand. Some scholars think it's 120,000 kids who don't know right from left yet. Others uh, think it, it may be um, 120,000 people that weren't morally uh, they weren't morally wise. They, they were morally ignorant. They didn't know uh, right from wrong as a result of them living like they were living. Either way, God is saying, Jonah, you care more about your own comfort. You care more about your own comfort than anybody's salvation. Than the salvation of literally a city full of people who are spiritually dying. Why don't, why don't you get concerned about stuff that really matters rather than just your comfort? You know, in the, for you in the middle of your misery, God wants you to get past yourself and look what will last forever. And that's, that's more important than anything else. God wants us to care about cities, towns. God wants us to care about people. He says, should, should, I, should, I, should I not care about those people, even those people, those towns who are filled with people that God created and made and loved? Yeah, you should. My point is this, you know, you, you may fight with being miserable right now. And I hope you see how you need to change. Well, there are a lot of people that are living around you that are miserable. And there are only two things that are going to last forever, the word of God and people. See, God's truth is eternal. And people are going to live forever in one of two locations. And God wants to use you in their life. But you don't know how they really are. That's what you may think. But I, Mark, you don't know how they really are. I want you to get this today. But God loves you. He even loves them. And if you can put everything together in the middle of whatever you think makes you uncomfortable, makes you miserable, makes you mad, and give that up, surrender it to God, and say, God, I just want to be your, your man, your woman, in the people's lives I come in contact with. Man, what a difference that could make. Let's pray together right now. Father, help us to be light in a dark world, to love people who we don't think deserve your love, but it's not our call, it's your call. So you call us to love everyone just like you. Thank you for teaching us. And I pray, Lord, for anyone right now that's struggling with just being mad, being miserable. We take a look at Jonah. Take a look at our life. And see how we need to take these principles from your word and put them into practice. So we'll change, become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have a great week. I look forward to you uh, being with us next weekend.